On PM Express tonight, the latest development in the Yawaso West Wog on by-election violence. The president has set up a presidential commission of inquiry. But is this really the solution to the problem we witnessed yesterday, last week and all the other things that it raises about our democracy going into the 2020 elections? That's the subject uh, for interrogation tonight. Uh, we know that the Commission for Inquiry has set up to probe the, the elections and it has these individuals as the individuals constituting that particular commission. Justice Emil Short, former Shraj Bors, uncompromising firm in what he does, vehemently protective of his independence, uh, famed for investigating a sitting president whilst he was in office at Shraj. And so this is a really credible individual by all accounts uh, to chair the commission. Another very credible personality behind the commission that has been set up tonight by the president is Henry Tamensa Bunsu. He's a member and we know her work in jurisprudence both here in Ghana and internationally is unparalleled and she is a member of the committee as well. And of course, a former IGP, himself a lawyer, uh, worked on international scenes, uh, training police elsewhere on the, con on the continent and within the UN system, is also a, a member of the committee. And some people forget, but it was under his watch that um, the, 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 the man who was, was suspected of killing, the, uh, being a serial killer, between 1998 and 2002 was arrested. It was under his watch that that happened. And he's a member of, the, of this commission. And of course, our own Ernest Kofi Abuchi, secretary to the commission, former uh, dean of Gimpa, is a secretary uh, to the commission. Now, these are the terms of reference very quickly. To make full, faithful and impartial inquiry into the circumstances and established facts leading to the violence last week, to identify persons responsible for the events, associated violence and injuries. Now, there's a lot of this question tonight about this particular term of reference. And they will hear from a private legal practitioner, former member of parliament, John Ndebu, who has some fascinating thoughts on whether this is even relevant in the first place. We'll, we'll hear from him shortly. Uh, also, to inquire into any matter uh, it considers incidental, and this is important, or reasonably related to the causes of the event and the associated violence. My guess will go into what these incidental and reasonably related matters should be, knowing what our democracy ha has, has the, the troubles that democracy have been going through in the last few uh, years with vigilante groups, with the fear of 2020, with uh, the integration of party loyalists into the national security and the politicization of our national security. Should that possibly be some of the incidental things they should be looking into? I don't know. My guests will, 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 will share thoughts on that. Also, to submit within one month, so this is a time frame, one month, its report to the president, giving reasons for its findings and recommendations, including appropriate sanctions, if any. And this is where some other additional controversy will be interrogated, because we've seen commissions of inquiry before. They put recommendations for the president, and the president can choose and pick an issue in a white paper. So what is really the point of this? We interrogate that. And also, they, the minority today have been responding to it. Uh, they, they have since welcomed this. The minority and DC members have welcomed this, uh, but also insist that the president must implement the recommendations of the commission. The big question, is this the solution to the problem? Stay with us here on PMS. When we return, we'll be interrogating this with people who really know what they're talking about. My guest in the studio tonight, Emmanuel Bombande, UN Senior Mediation Advisor and former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, is in the studio with us tonight. And also Justice Adam Sremsai is a law lecturer and at Gimpa, and private legal practitioner as well, uh, is in the studio with us. And so we are at a place just a day shy of exactly one week when the violence erupted in the Iwaso West Wagon by elections, that the president has set up a commission of inquiry, and it follows wide condemnation. I, and I was commenting today that I haven't seen an event or an incident in Ghana that has attracted this, mu has attracted this much condemnation and, and statements. In fact, today, the Ghana Medical Association, 
they issued a statement condemning the violence and calling for action. In fact, they talk about how such violence end up burdening the already weakened health system because they have to now attend to injured people and testing the emergency uh, health care delivery. That is how serious uh, this has become. The UNDP has issued it. People were calling me from all over the world asking me whether I'm safe. Meanwhile, this was in Baolishi in the one constituency. But we shouldn't take it for granted. There are bigger issues that it raises about, you know, our democracy. And we are where we are tonight with the Commission of Inquiry. Let me start by asking you, gentlemen, your, your reaction, initial reaction to the Commission of Inquiry. Mr. Bande, what's, what's, your, what's your initial take on, on the setting up of this? First of all, we must appreciate this as a significant and bold step. And to that extent, uh, commend the presidency, the vice president and the president for coming out with such a commission and the type of people that are on the commission and this will be my reasons one it's not just about the identification of the persons responsible for the violence mm -hmm. and the sanctions that should be meted out but it is precisely to ensure that we re-establish as a people confidence in our security mechanism, okay. in our security system, so that the caliber of your commission and the quality of work and how their recommendations will be implemented would at the same time assure Ghanaians that the shock that we all have experienced, particularly in our own interpretation of our democratic credentials and what it means in terms of our security and the responsibility of the government to protect the sense I get from the formation of this commission is that we will re-establish that trust, though it will depend also on the work that will be done. But we know from the personalities that you have introduced, yep. they are solid, they are independent-minded people, they, they have their integrity, which they have acquired in their lifelong, very well-appreciated uh, careers, than simply being on a commission and we i don't need to go uh, uh, one by one maybe on you them. should maybe you should well you uh, should. already you know uh, emil short for who he is because uh, justice emil short has a way of looking at anything that undermines the state institution and makes individuals to be able to use their own positions in whichever way for him, it, it, it forms a form of corruption. Okay. So uh, Justice Emily Shaw has a way of looking at corruption, not just in terms of dipping your hands in the kitty and taking out something, but how you abuse the responsibility assigned to you by the state. Okay. And that is why this commission takes us above anything that is partisan. And that's why it is impartial, because it there establishes that there is credibility also at stake. Uh, Professor. Henrietta Mensabosu, you've introduced her. Uh, she is of an international sure. repute. Uh, she's worked with the UN. She is a solid leader uh, of our female gender yeah. that we are all proud of. Uh, you have talked about uh, uh, former IGP, yeah, Patrick, Patrick Champon. Champon. Yes. But if you look at the three of them, uh, Justice Emil Schultz brings in the human rights, the justice issues, but also the social justice component. Yeah. Uh, Professor Henry Mensah Bonsu brings in the international knowledge and dimension of jurisprudence, yeah. but also the aspects of reconciliation and how you promote peace. Yeah. Then IGP Patrick Achampong brings in the discipline of how a police should be okay. and the mechanism and machinery of how our police system should operate. Yeah. Then my good friend uh, Enes Abutsi, a brilliant yeah. young lawyer who has been a dean already of the Faculty of Law at Gimpa, being the secretary just simply rounds it up. So I think that that brings in a certain level of confidence. But let me then quickly add that it's not just about the individuals, but it's the establishment of the credibility, as I talked about, and the mechanism that we can trust again our security coordination. And the third point I wanted to make is that there is no problem you should leave at the surface level without appreciating the structure. Okay that beyond and that is what i understand by incidental and reasonably related yes. matters that will be yes. arising yeah that it doesn't matter what our commissioners 
will do to address this problem, we need to go beneath and take it from the root, which is vigilantism, political vigilantism. We are all shocked and awoken by the violence of uh, mm. uh, Ayawasu uh, West Wogon. But when I followed it and I was not, uh, I've been traveling, I've been trying to recover, I just got back. The first thing that hit me was, are you surprised? Okay. We, this has been coming. The problem is we refuse to appreciate that there is a constant accumulation each time the violence occurred by these rampaging vigilante groups. We had a way of dismissing it. Now this Ayawaso West Wogan hit us badly. Yeah. But you know what? For those who refuse to understand the psychology of violence and what it has the potential and the capacity to do, this could be nothing compared to what could still happen. Okay. So the commission also has a certain value to it that what we cannot immediately describe because it has not yet happened. In the same way, we could not have described Ayawa West Wagon because it hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. And so something else that can happen that we cannot describe could be probably five times the magnitude of this and later on 10 times the magnitude. So the commission also has to be the final point of saying People, let's go back and let's reason again as a common people with our sense of respect for one another, the humanity that binds us together as Ghanaians, and stop this. Interesting. So we'll be delving into those other details. I think you've raised a lot of uh, meat on that that we'll be fleshing. Because if you look at that incidental and other reasonably related cases, I think that is where a lot of the meat will be. Because yeah. once you've dealt with the specific case of Ayawaso, you then need to look at, I guess, the root causes. Exactly. The, the things that have triggered it. Exactly. And I've heard people already who uh, suffer, they say, no matter how long it takes, we'll retaliate. Uh -huh. uh, people already say that. No matter uh -huh. how long it takes, we were beating, we will retaliate. Yeah. And so people already started planning how, if we win power, we can also show. Yeah. So I guess we'll, we'll, we'll expand yeah. that. But you, what's your thoughts on this as well, the commission? your own reaction to it yeah the personalities who are on this commission i have no doubt whatsoever that these are men who are above board they are people who have built their integrity over the years so there is no question about the individuals who are on this um, commission evans when you pour water into any container it doesn't matter the color of the water. It will take the shape of the container. Mm -hmm. What this means is that irrespective of the quality of individuals you put into a legal structure or legal framework, like a commission of inquiry, the effect of that commission and the work that the individuals will do cannot be anything different from what the shape of the commission or the container is. What has been the effect of commissions of inquiry over the years? And let me say even in recent times, under the 1992 Constitution. You see, when there is a problem, okay, there are two ways of solving the problem. Actually, three. One is to solve it on the surface. When you solve it on the surface only, the root causes will generate different you know, manifestations at the surface. The second option is to tackle it at the root only. When you tackle at the root only, the problem doesn't occur again. However, the, the, the surface effects will linger on. Mm. And people will say that, like you are saying, no matter how long it takes, we will retaliate. However, the third option is to solve it both at the surface and also at the root. When you do that, then you have dealt an eternal blow to the problem. When I see the commission of inquiry, and I saw the individuals, I was happy. But then when I look at the container, the commission of inquiry itself. As prescribed by the constitution. Constitution, then I get worried. Mm -hmm. Why? A commission of inquiry, which is a legal you know, establishment, as we know, the first problem is that Whatever recommendation the commission brings out is subject to what? The president's discretion. Whether to accept them, accept some of them, 
reject all of them or accept or reject some. So therefore, at the end of the day, we still have to go back to the political, you know, discretion. So he's not bound he, he, he's not. to necessarily implement what comes to him what by way of recommendation from the commission. Exactly. Then, if, I don't know if you remember the uh, Rekun Brobi, the Republic versus Rekun Brobi, yes. the decision yeah. that came out. Yeah. At least that it was is challenged the, at the appeals court. The right? challenge, yeah. yeah. So what actually the jurisprudence on commission of inquiry is now is that persons who are, you know, investigated are brought before the committee to testify as witnesses. Okay. Cannot be prosecuted because ah. one way or the other, uh, commission of inquiry is the, the, the jurisprudence is to look at problems and then try to solve it in a more elaborate manner than to pick individuals and prosecute them. Okay. Then the question is, if you invite someone as a witness and he says something, how then do you use his testimony to later prosecute him, okay. which sometimes offends the idea of justice? Okay. Now, if you look at the second term of reference of the commission, it mm -hmm. says that we should find persons... Identify persons responsible for or who has been involved in the events associated with violence and injuries. So, obviously, the persons who are responsible... <coughs> or who may be found responsible for this, are likely to be persons who, if the commission was not there, could have been, prosecuted. Have been prosecuted. Using the criminal, using the criminal procedure. procedure. So the ultimate effect is that it is likely, looking at what has been happening, that the persons who may be identified per second you know, term of reference mm -hmm. may not be punished. And that is where... May not be criminally, criminally prosecuted. prosecuted and uh -huh. if found guilty... Punished. Why? Because of the ruling on the back of the um, Ghana 50 thing. Yeah. Okay. So Which that says that once you've gone through the commission system, the commission, it cannot be a base. The commission report cannot be a basis for your prosecution. Is that that's, that's what that, it says? That is the general, okay. you know, jurisprudence. Interesting. Now, the, the, because I mean, if it's you, if you are not assured, so usually what happens in the instrument, you are assured that you may be. I mean, if you come to testify. The evidence will not be used against you. Otherwise, I won't come. I mean, if <laughs> if the commission is someone be, why would I come and testify? But the commission has the powers of a high court, correct? Yeah, that is where the immunity comes in. Because you see, whatever power you have, once you are not a court, once you are not a court, if I give evidence to you, everyone has the right not to incriminate himself. Okay. Even even you understand. So if you are not a court and you summon me and I come, the question, the, the issue is whether I'll be frank, honest. To give you evidence or testimony that mm -hmm. will, you know, will, that will help your work, mm -hmm. and the purpose of the commission, if you follow the jurisprudence and all the writings on it, it tells you that is to give a frank, honest, and open, you know, uh, 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 what we call account of issues, so that the problem will be solved, broader than just prosecuting someone. Okay. Now bringing it back to my classification of surface and root. Now what this is going to uh, result in, in is that when it comes to the surface. Okay, um, the surface effect is to prosecute individuals right now mm -hmm. and then leave them uh, and, and leave the root cause. Now, with this process, obviously, we are not going to see prosecutions to punish people. So, you don't see that happening here? I honestly don't see that happening after the commission. That's interesting because if you read the final term of reference, it says to so submit within one modest report to the president, given reasons for findings and recommendations, including appropriate sanctions. Yeah, so when the commission of inquiries are, are formed and you are found guilty, there are sanctions, if you look at the Constitution, Chapter 23, there are sanctions there for persons who have been found guilty by commissions of inquiry. Okay. They may appeal against such findings. What, 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 what's the general nature of these sanctions? What does the Constitution so, say? For example, it may bar you from occupying public office okay. after maybe before, I mean, before 10 years, or you may only be eligible after 10 years. Okay. So these are some of the consequences that come out of co uh, commissions of inquiry. Can, 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 but imprisonment... Okay, so that's what I was going to ask. So none of the provisions that tells us about imprisonment, because the commission of inquiry is not a court. Therefore, cannot sentence a person to any form, I mean, imprisonment. So you may have some disadvantages or liabilities as a result of being found guilty by the commission but it doesn't include what criminal you know sanctions where you'll be sentenced to prison or fined or anything of that sort Th that that is that is that is very very interesting mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of and i want to play a very senior lawyer um john and deborah green 
he he gave an opinion on this very matter. He was he was very you know him. He, he doesn't bear <laughs> he doesn't suffer fools. Yeah. And he, he put this is this is how he put it. And they have been they they can easily be identified. So I don't see the the need of a commission of inquiry. With the greatest respect, that is my humble view. The IGP yesterday issued a statement, in fact, saying that they're expanding the criminal investigations into this matter and, and told us for the first time who and who is part of that probe in terms of the committee. And I asked that same question of your president just before you came on. Which of these two bodies would you give uh, precedence in terms of looking into this matter? The IGP's criminal probe or this one? I will give precedence to the, uh, the IGP's probe. I, I don't want to call the IGP's uh, a, a decision uh, or what he intends to do a probe. <laughs> a probe? No, an investigation, straightforward investigation. People have committed crimes, so they should be apprehended, invest, granted bail, investigations will go through, and they will be charged and prosecuted. That is the end of it. I'm, so, uh, I mean, and, and w the president of the republic has established a commission of inquiry. The IGP, an appointee of the president of the republic, is also carrying out some investigation. What is the meaning of that? I mean, I think that uh, we, with the greatest respect, uh, this question of uh, commission of inquiry, in my, my very humble view, is a non-starter. So Quick point, yes, quick point. I'll come to some money. Quick point, yes, yeah, so, on that. So, j just to conclude, what I foresee is that, first of all, we are not going to get the surface effect, okay? And the root effect, which I believe comes from not just the violence that happened, not even vigilantism, but a possible breach of the Constitution. Why do I, why do I bring in the question of the breach of the Constitution? You see, when we talk of National security. Okay, so that is a bigger conversation okay. that we will come to because yeah. it's it's a whole prank by itself, um, because it, it begs the question, which I guess uh, and Deborah mentioned. So there's a commission of inquiry. However, the videos and by way by the way the national security minister, I come publicly and said, I know these people who met out the balance. I send them there. They work in my secretariat. And this man who is admitting to this is appointed by the president. And yet the president sets up a commission to probe him and the results of the actions of the people he says, I sent. So it begs that question yeah. about why, the, if the president, this, the man you appoint says, I did it. I sent the guys there. We saw what they did. He, he justifies it. So why is it not a commission when you could simply, one, dis disappoint him, sack him, and get the police to investigate and prosecute? Mohammed, that's where we are with this. What's your own, based on the legal point of that we've said, I, what's I, your reaction I, I appreciate very much the legal arguments, <laughs> and I appreciate uh, my senior man, uh, John Indemore's <laughs> uh, uh, comment. And what I understand is that the investigations will go on, except that the legal argument is, why should you have the investigations going on, and on top of it, you have the Commission of Inquiry? Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is the way uh, I, I look at it. Okay. First of all, the minister that you refer to, yeah. his accounts kept changing. Okay. So we need to establish, you know, it's very important. Your minister for national security is the front line of coordinating your protection. Okay. And at the level of the United Nations, it is the responsibility of the state to protect its citizens. Mm -hmm. And the government of the day has the responsibility to make sure that protection is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, if the official of the state that the president swore into office to play that function changes the accounts of events and then finally says, I'm the one who sent them out there, what the inquiry does is to help us to understand why were the accounts changing. Okay. Because it's not just for today. It's also for us to know what do we do tomorrow. Okay. I was grilled for three hours before the Parliamentary Select Committee to be a Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs. Yeah. The reason for that is precisely because I was to be sworn in to have a certain burden of responsibility to the state. So you don't have people who take that lightly. So that for me is one. But secondly, if the purpose of the 
inquiry were to duplicate also the investigation of the IGP solely on the premise of sanctions to those who were or those who will be found guilty. I can fully appreciate the, com the complete agreement legally. Okay. But beyond the legal uh, premise, okay. which then includes the sanctions, I go back to my earlier point to say, for me, the commission of inquiry would then help us to go deeper and tackle the root. And all of us admit that, whether we like it or not, Whereas we are referred to as a beacon of democracy in Africa, we have created demons. And those demons could devour us. Mm -hmm. Those monsters that we have created, we are calling vigilante groups, have the potential to create an environment in which all of us would be so much threatened. And that is why it is not just about looking at the threat, but its potential impact and how do we prevent that threat? Okay. So we agree vigilantism now is a threat. We agree its potential impact from the Awayasu, uh, Awayasu yeah. wagon was uh, by election. By but what measures do we take to ensure it doesn't happen? And if you look at it from this level, that is why I appreciated the commission because they will elevate us beyond our partisanships okay. and create the environment in which we can look at one another in the mirror and say, look, Despite what we said we have achieved democratically, we are falling short. What do we do to rise up above this demon that we have set up to destroy ourselves and then go forward into the future? However, deterrent won't be there because sanctions, as you said, criminal sanctions, as in the said, said, crimes have been committed. People have been assaulted. Guns have been fired. People are in hospital right now. Yeah. We're injured, bloodied. Yeah. yeah. These are criminal acts. Yeah, and but but it, from what I've heard, the legal the, the, the lawyers explain, it appears that the commission, if any of these individuals currently under investigation by the CID, go before the commission, and they are a subject of the commission's own probe, and recommendations are made about them, it sort of cripples the CID's ability and the attorney general's ability to prosecute them thereafter. Yes. When they even deem me have committed crimes. I mean, so which is more important? The pursuit of the criminal investigations that will lead to prosecution, sanctions, people go to jail and deter others who might think in like 2020 that if you go with a gun, this will happen to you. Or root cause, more reconciliatory approach, deal with the national about politics, let's move forward as a democracy. Which, which is more important? The, the, the processes of justice that is reconciliatory does not preclude meeting out sanctions. Okay. So that when people then are held accountable... <laughs> I see it slightly. Yes, when people then are held... Slightly. Because sometimes people <laughs> misunderstand reconciliation to mean yeah. there is the concept of forgiveness that is not well explained and well understood. Okay. Forgiveness is also happening in the context of the accountability that says... You fell out, and this is the sanctions that we meted to you. And so my response to you and uh, lawyer. My, my lawyer friend would uh, even make a better clarification. Okay. Why do we think it must be A or B? Only investigations or inquiry? It should what? be both. It should be both. And it's very interesting on this program. Mm -hmm. What that means is that if IGP is listening, and I know he's listening, yeah. what then would happen is... He should precipitate his process so that the identifiable criminals mm -hmm. are not the ones who come before the commission of inquiry. Okay. So the, the, the argument that they cannot come before the commission because that would then exonerate them or in, uh, indemnify them, and for that matter, not to prosecute, will not happen. Okay. So as he explained earlier, we deal with the criminal component, the criminality. Okay. And once we are dealing with the criminality, we also tell ourselves we have to deal with the root. Because the, the reason I'm particular about that is two years ago, February 2017, yeah. I was in a television studio with uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament for Adentan, who is now Director for Communications of the NPP. NPP. Then uh, my good friend, who is now Ambassador of Ghana to Cuba, we had a very interesting discussion. I was pursuing the argument that just telling the police to go out there and apprehend vig the vigilante groups is simply not uh, being sincere. Because we know 
the mindset and what emboldens them and gives them that courage to continue to do what they are doing. That we needed as a country to identify that these groups are totally out of order. They should not exist in our political parties, and we didn't take the steps to do that. Interestingly, we had started in November 2016. The UN, both at the country level and the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel, where I have worked, were the ones who supported the National Peace Council. And in Moving Peak Hotel, all our party leaders at the top level signed a commitment of declaration to disband vigilante groups. Although they didn't do it. That was one of the very important steps before the December elections. Yeah. You know what has surprised me throughout me. these two years? The National Peace Council refuses to take that document. Okay. Go to the parties and say, look, you, you are the ones it. who signed this. Yeah. Why are you continuing to have vigilante groups? That will never come up. That and, document has never been shown and, anywhere. And, and, and my good friend, that is why the Commission of Inquiry should be so uh, comprehensive. Because when you are given an institutional responsibility in the states, whether you are the Peace Council, and by the way, uh, we should appreciate uh, Madame, her name has escaped me, the chair of the National Na Commission, Commission for Civic yeah. Education. Yeah. She names a problem and she Calls confronts on, it, yeah. and in some cases she has just been dismissed. Yeah. In fact, she was here on the show. She was sat between the two minority and majority leaders on the show, and she told them I was amazed. She told yes. them to the face, look, turn to the MPP guy, deal to him, turn to the MPP guy, and, and both of them, in the end, had to agree that we have to reverse course. Thank you very much. That is what I mean by somebody who occupies a position that is a state uh, responsibility and takes it seriously. So all this then would also come out. So that at the end of the day, you don't get invited to go and occupy a position and you use that to do gerrymandering politically, bring in people who flout, disrespect people, and create the type of atrocity that we saw in the by-election. Yes. It's completely uh, yes, uncalled sir. for. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> you, were, you were thinking the law and you were thinking to yourself yeah, what? Yeah. Not just the law, but also uh, public policy. Yeah. Um, and most of the things we are saying are very true. I, I just saw myself as advising the persons who are likely to appear before the, the commission. police and also and the, the commission. Okay, yeah. I mean, I would assess the consequence of each. Okay. And then I would advise my clients what, what to, to do. do. And my clients will always choose the commission. The commission. Mm -hmm. And then we just write a letter to the IGP that we are unable to cooperate with the because processes you are the because commission. of the commission. If, if you take the person to a court and you tell the court that I am, I am already, the person is already facing a commission of inquiry, the court is likely to, to adjourn and ask the person to finish because. It's a fact-finding commi you know, commission, so the courts would likely, are likely to give him the opportunity to finish with the commission before. In any case, why should the court be hearing a matter which a commission of inquiry is already hearing? So even though expressly it is not an exclusive, they are not exclusive processes, mm -hmm. but practically it's they going can. to be exclusive in the sense that the commission will take precedent over most of these things. But let's go back to the issue. You see, I see a huge constitutional issue here, which also goes to the roots that uh, Mr. Bombardi has been talking about, the root cause of the problem. You see, no matter how you look at it, vigilantes will not get access to guns and have, you know, these security support that we are all suggesting happen. Including in, intelligence. You know, yeah. Unless there is some formal... Or official acceptance of such you know persons into the security services now our constitution you know creates a system which does not allow such things to happen for persons who are not in the formal security services or intelligence agencies to have access to these you know level of uh, uh, arms and to control the public so my point is how did this happen how did this happen? National Security Secretary says, Council says, yeah, this but, is something. But that is, that is where I yeah. have a problem. Yeah. And I have talked to most you know, seasoned <clears throat> lawyers where, the who have a problem. The problem is this. The National Security Secretary, the National Security Coordinator, or the National Security Minister have no lawful power 
to employ people and arm them to control the public as we are being told. Okay. The only institutions that have that power to do that are the, uh, the, security, the former security service established by the constitution and the intelligence service that are established by the Acts of Parliament. So we are talking of the police service, okay. the Ghana Armed Forces, the prison service, the immigration service, customs, and then we talk of the BNI, which is the in, uh, sec, uh, in, internal security, uh, internal intelligence gathering agency, and then the research department, which is also external intelligence uh, gathering agency. Apart from this, I am not aware of the security, I mean, the, the, the National Security Secretariat having any lawful power to bring in people who uh, and arm them to do what happened, you know, in, 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 in uh, Yawasu. Yeah. So the question then is, how do we resolve this? Does the Commission of Inquiry have the mandate, or what do you call it, the jurisdiction to determine some of these constitutional issues? Okay. I think not. It's a fact-finding com commission, but there are still constitutional issues to be, to, be, to be resolved. And I believe that being constitutional issues, it is only the Supreme Court of Ghana that has the jurisdiction to answer those that, questions. That brings back to the statement issued by Occupy Ghana today. And they've indicated correctly. They've asked a series of questions of the the, the president, but also the uh, national security minister. And it said at the end that, based on that, they might go to the to court yeah. to challenge that because the man had publicly made pronouncements that could be a basis for. And so you're saying that, but it doesn't stop anybody from going to the Supreme Court. Two things. It may stop you depending on how you couch really your cause of action. The commission of inquiry. Yeah, because. Because the Commission of Inquiry is assessing facts, mm -hmm. if you want to dispute the facts, okay, then you, the Supreme Court itself may advise that that process should terminate. Because that's a broader scale fact-finding you know, commission than what the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court is, is, is a legal you know, place yeah. where things are restricted by law. So that is a bigger platform. Yeah. But then again, the yeah. issue of constitutionality could also be separated from the facts. Because it doesn't matter whether the, 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 the national security uh, um, you know, set up sent these guys to Ayawasu. The question is, do they do other things apart from, because the, the Commission of Inquiry is about Ayawasu to be specific. Yeah. But we also know mm -hmm. that these men do not just operate in Ayawasu. Mm. They operate <clears> in other aspects of Ayawasu. However, the Commission's terms of preference have given them power to do incidental related. So yeah. they could then yeah, go beyond. Go yeah, but beyond that, that could not... <laughs> <laughs> the commission can do what it is not allowed, no matter the terms of under the constitution. Under the constitution, okay. yeah. So they cannot determine constitutional questions. Okay. They cannot determine legal issues. Okay. They can only ascertain facts. Okay. So in that respect, the commission is limited in answering these questions that I'm raising. My question is: It may be that the commission may come up with recommendations that would, in a way, address some of these legal issues because. These are eminent lawyers already on the panel. So they may say some of the things that I'm saying here and make a recommendation to the president that, look, disarm these guys, disband that, and make it clear that the National Security Secretariat cannot and has no authority to do what they do by you know, bringing in people, arming them to do what the police, the military are, in, are empowered to do. Mm. Now, the question is, even if they make that recommendation and the president says, look, I'm not, I'm not going to accept it, what happens? Yeah. So my worry is that both surface-wise and root-wise, <laughs> this commission may not solve any of the issues, the problems we are, we are actually... Yeah. I want to step you know, in here. Please. Thank you for the brilliant uh, uh, analysis you have just made. But there is something that I would call a guide to the conscience of the whole nation as we speak. Okay. The public anger, and you introduced this program with all the professional bodies, everybody's uh, yes. issuing statements yes. from their own perspectives. Yeah. The public anger is so palpable <clears throat> that the president, I believe, will be well advised not to allow the weaknesses and loopholes in the legal system to let this just become another whether investigation or inquiry, yeah. that will just be washed under the bridge yeah, and life will continue. Many of those in the exactly. Past. And life will continue as, as normal. Usual, yeah. So I, I want to believe that the president would be so well advised that this has to be different from previous uh, commissions of inquiry and what they did. Secondly, 
and I don't know whether that is permissible. But it will be interesting to find out whether the commission itself will not insist that we should have a monitoring mechanism okay. of how their uh, recommendations, recommendations would be implemented. Whether they will continue to play a role, maybe not. But that at the end of the day, the, the president has to continue on a certain, if you call it, line of practical implementation that is not just his decisions, but it, it's also the implementation that will assuage the public anger and bring back a certain confidence. For that to happen, you need to carry the people constantly along. You need to let them see that they do not just make recommendations, but these recommendations not only are they going to be implemented, but this is the way they will be implemented. So in other words, we have a mechanism that says in three months, A will be done. And somebody is just watching to see in the three months, has that been done? Mm. Why is it not happening? What needed to be done for it to happen? If all these then come into play, we produce the checks that will now make sure that all the issues that appear to be weaknesses are then also covered. Okay. So that at the end of the day, we can benefit from both. But it's very important from what he has suggested. In fact, he has even convinced me more that if you just got a few people and then you said, okay, you are going to be sanctioned. But then what has brought us to this point continues. What's the point? And I want to go back to a point that you have <clears throat> made. Because in my personal capacity, I've tried to influence thinking here and there. And you are so right. People feel that the only way is when we are able to pay back. There has to be a cutting point in which we would simply say that. We cannot continue as a country like that. Because when the cycle you, must stop. Yeah. When you pay back, the people you are paying back to I say, oh, wait a minute. We are also preparing to pay back. Yeah. So at the end of the day, what have we done to ourselves as a people? And that's why today we need a certain high level of moral imagination. Okay. That says, today I was a victim. But you know what? Beyond me as an individual, but for the purposes of the common interest, the good of Ghana, I take my slap as the sacrifice for this country to be different. I will slap you back. <laughs> and that is why it's amazing. I don't want to go into the theology because somebody's <laughs> going to say, but you are you a Catholic priest? <laughs> uh, knowing that my uh, Catholic theology respects my priest, I'm not supposed to go too far. But the point is, we all want to profess our Christian values. Our Muslim brothers and sisters want to profess their Islamic values. But when it comes to the practical implication on our life, we say, no, 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 no. I'm a Christian, but I'm going to pay back. Yeah. This is our problem. So we don't bring the values and the principles, whether it is faith, whether it's tradition, culture, into our day-to-day -day living and our governance. Mm. Interesting point. And I guess if you look at Madame Henrietta Mengsa Bonsu, she was on the National Reconciliation Commission, and so maybe she brings a bit of that into the conversation. We'll return from the short break. There's something that, Ms. Mbamande, you said about um, uh, the president should be well advised that, you know, the outcome of this should not be treated as exactly. business as usual. But then it, it begs the question whether we, we, we have the faith that this time, this government, this president, will be different. And you've mentioned, I think suggested, what is the role of civil society, for example, in sustaining this pressure beyond, it seems like going to bed and say, oh, now Commission for Inquiry, thank God, we can leave it. What should civil society be doing uh, post this uh, commission's work? And then we'll also look at, should, is this gonna be a public hearing? Because we'll, we, are, we are keen, we are interested. We don't want this to be closed door uh, that, you know, people go and have a conversation and they tell us, post that. Uh, it's part of the monetary mechanism. If we hear and know what is said live on TV, on radio, then we all follow to the point where recommendations are made. But does the law allow that to happen? When we return, we'll discuss that and my guests will have their thoughts on that. Stay with us here on PM Express. We are still live on PM Express. My guest in the studio, Imano Bombande, is UN Senior Mediation Advisor and former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Also with me is lawyer, uh, law lecturer, uh, 
Justice Adam Stremsai with GIMPA, Power Legal Practitioner. So, uh, a, a quick legal point. Is the Commission of Enquiry allowed to sit in public? I think open to everybody else? Yeah, that, that is the general rule. Okay. Commissions of Enquiry are supposed to sit in public, except where the sitting may incur um, public you know, um, safety order and then security. Okay. But looking at this issue, I hope someone may not say that there's a national, there's a national security. security issue and things may come up that people cannot take or whatever, so it should be uh, you know, in camera. But that is where the challenge is. <laughs> so maybe that is a good indicator for us to see whether this commission of inquiry is a genuine is something that effort we, yeah. to fix so, the problem yeah, so that maybe or to throw the, us off. That is the first okay. test. If it happens that it's public, that is fine because we need to know, after all, it is a public anger that brought about this you know, commission of inquiry. Now, I, 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 I want to make one more point sure. about the public policy dimension to this. You see, when you have a leader, a leader is supposed to look at the people, as Mr. Bombani said, and carry the conscience of the public, of the people. And if the leader does that, then the issues of retribution, let me, whether I keep my slap for the service of Ghana or I wait for my team to you know, re retain the slap, then those issues are resolved. But when the leadership, and here it has nothing to do really with the commission members because everything is subject to the final acceptance of the president and his yeah. willingness to implement. So if the leader, in this case the president, is unwilling or unable to even implement the, 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 the commission's you know, recommendation, then we'll go back to, that is even what will make people more angry to even say that, look, no matter how long it takes, I'll retaliate. So, I see this as a major test. And let's face it, we've had, this is not even under this administration, yeah. this is not the first time that we've had commissions, you know, of uh, search commi commissions or committees. So the question has always been, uh, what, what, what are we going to see differently from the previous ones? Mm. And I hope that things will go as Mr. Bombardi is, mm. after that is what everyone wants. Yeah. So, Bande, yeah. so it begs the question, how do we, how do civil society, the public, make this different from the, what we've seen before? And do you have faith in the ability of our political leaders to make this commission's work a turning point? Evans, the state we all belong to that we call the Republic of Ghana is way too high up there and so important that the better res responsibility is about how can we make things right, not for any interest whatsoever, whether it's individual, collective, whether it's political, or you name it. And the way to uh, reflect about this is how do we bring to the fore the damage, some of which we cannot have the space to talk about generally. Let me give you just one quick example, and then I'll, I'll respond to you. How do you take our police officers' uniform? I'm talking about our real police officers mm -hmm. who were trying to coordinate and ensure the security of the by election. Then all of a sudden, they see hooded men wielding guns and interfering in their work, crisscrossing them and having their own operation and making it impossible for them to even begin to understand what is happening. It denigrates them. It makes their professionalism to be so degraded. It makes them feel like you people are nothing. Yeah. We are the real ones. Yeah. And what that does is it erodes the professionalism yeah. of our men in uniform. So the Ghana Police Service, as we speak, I have in the uh, past year interacted a lot with our military observers, military officers in the Central African Republic. <clears throat> I salute them because they watch this program a lot. And I have come to understand what they go through. They want to put themselves, you know, in the front line, even if it means to the peril of their lives. But we play and toy with their profession. So that's why it's in the interest of the IGP and all its men and women, and for that matter, our security agencies, to ensure that this is not about anybody trying to interfere with your professionalism. This is about your life, mm. your entire career in which you are taking care of your family, 
it's on the basis of the uniform you wear, the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Let no one who was appointed because of a political position come and undermine that. Okay. The problem is because people fear reprisals, some of which are under the table, they are sometimes cowed. But I think there's a sufficient groundswell of public support now for our real security agencies that if you are prepared to take the right steps, we the public will support, support you because it's about all of us it's about our safety and we will not allow your work to be compromised mm. the reason i say this is because go from one country to the other in africa mm. and ask yourself where did the conflicts and the violence and the destruction and the civil war come from it came first from the erosion of the institutions of the state okay. when people feel that they outside as he explained what the constitution provides can now indirectly toy and play with your police service, your military, then you are finished. Okay. Just for the sake of time, watch your civil society role be in, in, in 30 seconds. In 30 seconds, keep, keeping the heat on this. they should be in the front line of the monitoring mechanism I talked about, okay. asking the right questions <clears throat> and in partnership with you, the media, for the purposes of the good of the greater majority, okay. which is the general population of Ghana. Sir. Yeah, when it comes to civil society, I have my own concerns about how we civil society you know, persons mm -hmm. monitor these things. Because you can see that within some few days, something new will come up and we'll, all of us will leave Ayawasu and yeah, focus on that. Yeah. So there's no sustained uh, pressure deliberate on this. pressure yeah. on this. You see, the security services count on us a lot. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that happen, they may not like it and sometimes they pity us when we are being beaten by these yeah. non-military guys. But the thing is, they are restrained in how much they can do. They would rather want to see we, the people, taking the lead and they what supporting okay. us from behind. So it should never be the case that we will sit down and expect them to take the lead because we all know the consequences yeah. of their taking you know, yeah. the, the, the lead. So yeah. we need to take it as a responsibility as Ghanaians, as civil society, yeah. that look, this particular issue should not be treated like, like any others. Else. Yeah. yeah. And, and thankfully, we have a commission that we can hold the precedence to. Thank you very much for watching us on PM Express tonight. Um, and I'm pretty sure in the coming days, this commission will start work. Some of the committee members have already said they are waiting for their formal letters to come to them. And we'll see this commission working in the next one month. Uh, we'll be watching this very closely together with us here on PM Express. Enjoy the rest of your evening.